thank you guys for letting me come here and do this. Um, I find it truly amazing that uh, Ryan chose this weekend to not be here. Um, and I, I wanted to say that I've been teasing Ryan for a while about uh, that he actually only works one day a week. But I, I came to the realization um, six weeks ago, he gave me a challenge that I needed to preach, and he said, when? And I went, I don't know, I'll get back to you. <laughs> and uh, 10 days, two weeks back, he kind of stopped me and went, pick a day, this one or this one, which one? And so it was this one, and again, it's nice he's gone, but in prepping for this, I realized if he has to put a sermon together every week, and I've had six weeks to prep this one, um, he kind of works hard. <laughs> so I have a, a couple of things I brought with me um, because it stems from the fact that when we come here, we end up getting introduced to Jesus. And, and through that, he says, come to me. And we all come. And we're broken and beaten and weary. But we all come the same way with the fact that we come with baggage. <laughs> and with this baggage, it's all of our, our issues, the things that our life has, has done to us, the things that we hang on to and we drag it around with us. It's what we're proud of. It's, it's our comfort. We're comfortable with our discomfort. We've grown used to it. And when he come, we come, he says... Just bring it. And we bring things like shame and emptiness and guilt and depression and the fact that we're lost. We bring our stubbornness, our greed, our selfishness, our pride, our lies. We realize we're broken and battered and abused and angry. We have addictions. We're lonely, we're scared, and oftentimes we're self-loathing. And he still says, come on, come into me. This baggage you're dragging around with you, you gotta put it down, you gotta give it to me. And to do that, he tells us to spend time in his word, he tells us to have fellowship with our family around us, the ones who care about us. And he says, sit still, talk to me, pray to me. And when we do, he has uh, promised that all these things will be taken away. He tells us that we'll find a peace. And in that peace, we can give up all the baggage. Boy, I'm just gonna cut myself. <laughs> Didn't quite think this part through well enough. <laughs> but you bring it in, and you hand it to him, and little by little, Sharper knife would be good. Little by little, he gets rid of it. And little by little, we can hand all this over to him. I'm not going to do it. <laughs> I'm going to stab myself somewhere in there. And little by little, he takes it away. Should have thought about it. And he makes the baggage bearable. And he cleans it up. And he says, it's all good. It's clean. It doesn't have to hurt. We bring our stuff. And he's faithful to remember that it was painful for us. But he's there to hold our hands, hold our heads in his lap, and show us what it means. 
but he still tells us, go and find that time, that quiet time. Come meet with me. I want to talk to you. I want that fellowship. But we're stubborn. We don't always do it. We're too busy. Our plans are what we keep looking at. Our plans are what controls. It's that little thing. We still think we control this stuff. And, and, and we don't really go to it. We talk about it. I'm praying. Hey, God, don't forget us. Hey, God, they asked for a prayer request. You know what it is. Take care of them. You ship those little letters to them. But we don't take that time to go, what do you want from me? Where am I supposed to be? About 10 days back, I got to go to St. Gertrude's Monastery in Cottonwood, Idaho with Pastor Jeffrey and Pastor Ryan. We were going for a spiritual formation retreat. Really big word that I didn't quite understand, so I kind of went with no expectations. Um, you can ask some of my Bible study groups that if I don't know something, I Google. So I Googled spiritual formation retreat. <laughs> and, or, and there's a lot out there. And, it, and so I printed a two page thing to read so that I could understand what spiritual formation was. You know, I, I read it and I still went, what's a spiritual formation? And what I came to realize it's the how and why of my faith. Why, 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 do I, why do I go to Jesus? How do I do that? And it's in that quiet time. We got to St. Gertrude's Monastery. It's a beautiful, beautiful place. And you pull on to the, to the campus there and you go park and we're met by one of the sisters, sisters and on. And there's just a calmness. She's talking. Telling us things, here's this, here's that. She points out do's and don'ts. You go here, go there. But very calm, very quiet. And in that time you're standing there, you're a hundred feet from the road, but you don't hear the road noise. Literally, cars are going by, you don't hear them. <coughs> it's a beautiful um, valley setting. This is slightly up the hill. From the monastery, I realize it's kind of bled out on here, but you can't maybe see it, but this valley's huge. A lot of activity. There's two cities on either side. You see them at night, the lights. I mean, it's just clear as a bell. But again, as you're on the grounds in the monastery, you don't hear that life. Ryan and I took a walk up the hill. We walked up through what's called the Stations of the Cross. It's, it's the journey of Christ to the Cross. I don't know how many, I was never familiar with it until I saw it there. And as we topped out onto the little plateau of the hillside, you could hear cars. You could hear a plane that was flying overhead. 30 seconds earlier on the hill, coming up, you couldn't hear it. it went, and all of a sudden, we're both standing there going, and your cars. And he goes, yeah, we didn't hear them over there. Literally, I mean, the little box down on the side there by the tree in the corner, that's one of the stations of the cross. And from there up through all 14 stations, you couldn't hear the cars and the road noise. It's like the monastery is in a bubble, a protected, sanctified, just quietness. It's in that quietness that you have fellowship and you start talking about things. After we got our briefing and we went to our room that first day that night, we had talked about we're gonna go through the book of Replenish. It's called Replenish. And there's a quote on page 12 that really just hit me. And that first night, too far, too far. Who's pushing me or you? <laughs> Perfect. So the Replenish book is by Lance Wick and it says getting healthy will require us to pull back the veneer. It won't happen until we're serious enough to get honest, own our stuff, and take responsibility for our soul care. Wanting to go to some of the most private corners of our soul, dark places where personal ambition, insecurity, fear, and brokenness reside. 
These and other lurking soul predators would love to devour you. And I read that, that Monday, uh, Tuesday afternoon, the first day we're there, and, and I highlighted it, and, and I circled it, and stars. And I realized that I've been going to this church for three years. I sat right back there. I came to this altar when Bob was preaching one day. Don't ask what he preached on. I don't remember. I do remember that when he was talking after the words, he was talking to me and said, it's time. Come up here and give it to God. And, and I, I, I did. And it's been beautiful. But you still have to go back. And Jesus talks to us because he knows these dark places still exist. These hidden gems of things we think we still control, we want to hang on to because there's comfort in our discomfort. We get used to it. Uh, Tuesday morning, went in for prayer. Now this was after a silent breakfast. One of the rules is for the three meals, at least once in silence, it's breakfast every morning. Now, I need you to picture, we're at a table, seat six, there's Ryan, uh, Jeffrey, Wright, and I, and we have to be in silence. <laughs> <laughs> and they feed you there, and they feed you good, and they make some of the things they feed you. And we had oatmeal, and you could make eggs and toast, and there was fruit and juices and coffee and water and milk, and it's there, and you eat. Whatever you want, eat. But if you take it, we really ask, they say, we really ask that you eat it. And Jeff and Ryan and I are looking at each other, going, looking up, going, does it look like we have a problem eating? <laughs> <laughs> if we take it, we go eat it, it's going to happen. There, there's not a doubt that if we put it on a plate, we intend to eat it. We're good at it. <laughs> and they were, they were joyous to watch us eat. They, they take great joy in serving. And so there we are in silence, eating breakfast. I had some of the best oatmeal I've had ever. And the second morning I tried there, it's called Monastery Granola. They make it. And at a silent breakfast, when I took that first bite, I was just like, oh, this is good. And his face lit up and he's looking at me going, and we, he's going, what is that? What, what is that face for? You look over joy. I, I must know. <laughs> and so after breakfast, I'm like, dude, the granola had crunch. I ate the oatmeal first. It's in milk. I got my granola. It's in milk. I mean, the oatmeal looking at the granola going, it's going to be soggy. <laughs> nope. That was crunchy. Stick to your ribs. It was amazing. So that first morning, we go to prayer. Now, the sisters are getting ready for a visitation where somebody, the head honcho, comes out to look them over and talk to them and make sure they're doing what they're supposed to be doing. So they had spent time writing a visitation prayer. Um, I learned after the fact that there was six weeks spent on three lines of this prayer, where the sisters are in prayer wondering, are these the right words, God? Is this what you want to hear? And as we're going through this prayer, I know they felt it. We're all going, oh my God, they wrote this prayer for our visit. They wrote this for us. Um, I didn't think I could take the card that it was typed on, so as everybody was walking, I'm like, trying to get a decent <laughs> picture. It's not a great picture, but it's here, and it's as gracious God as we prepare for our upcoming visitation. Help us to listen with the ears of our hearts as you call us to a deeper life together. A life of love and transformation as we strive on the journey to wholeness. May we be open to healing where you were calling us to grow as we recommit ourselves to our common vision. Prayer awakens, justice impels, and compassion acts. And as I'm reading this prayer, I'm thinking, they wrote this for us. Knowing full well they had, they didn't even know us. And it said, God wrote this for us. This is a prayer that wasn't just for the sisters, is it? The morning that they read this, it was the first time it had been read in the church. And there we stood, the three of us, looking at a journey of trying to grow and get closer to God.
the first day we spent doing some reading and meeting together and just really digging in on questions and things and it just little things kept hitting me and over the three years that i've come here a lot of you've heard this expression and i'm always wondering where's the something more there, there's there's got to be something more to this and i just realized that there there is i just wasn't there Every time I would get close to it in my meetings with Brian, I was right there on the edge of what that something more was. And there was, and Ryan could look at it and see it happen. It, there was a wall that would just slam right in front of me. And it was a wall of separation from me to God. Because I learned years ago, the connection never fails from God to me. It's disconnected from me to God. I cut it off. I'm the one sniffing the line. I'm the one who puts that wall up every single time. And it's because you get comfortable in your discomfort and you stand there. We were there for a spiritual formation retreat and there's a counselor there. Her name is Sister Lillian. Um, I don't know where I'm going with this. That's Sister Lillian. She's five foot nothing <laughs> and is one of the most powerful people I've ever met. Ask Jeffrey about it. This lady, you walk into her room and she smiles and the room lights up. Her eyes literally sparkle when you're sitting there with her. And she begins to talk to you. And immediately you go, did you Google me? Did you call my pastor? Did you talk to my wife? Because you know way too much. And she speaks truth right into you. And she told me things like, you're on a journey, and you're struggling. And she told me that the reason I struggle is that in all my baggage that was taken care of, I had held on to things that I thought, you know what? I have control. God doesn't get this, you know? He doesn't understand how strong I am. I mean, I'm right there with him. But see, I kept back. And I hung on to, and I was weighed down by my box that I wasn't gonna get rid of. I hung on to it. I hid it, it held secrets, it had addictions, darkness, but it was mine. Christ has come to me, give it to me. But that's an act you have to understand. Because for years, I, I had a question. I didn't understand it. Somebody kept saying, you got to surrender to God. I did. God, it's yours. Go for it. Go ahead. It's yours. Don't worry. It's yours. Because God can't see everything. can be. I know he can because I still have mine. And I learned that surrender is an act where you come to the foot of that cross and kneel down. Because Sister Lillian said, surrender is a physical act. It's not an emotional act. It's not a mental act. It's physical. You have to get to a point where it hurts more to hang on to it than it does to let it go. And she goes, but to let it go there, you have to do something. She said, you got to have a physical act. And it didn't matter where my box was, it was mine. And I still held it. I was holding it. It was tight. The duct tape was representative of the things that it weren't going anywhere. The box has been battered and bruised and kicked around. It's beat down, hiding in a corner. But the whole time it was me. It was my hands holding it. And Sister Lillian sat in her chair and she goes, now you've got to understand surrender. She goes, this is not surrender, this is fighting. She goes, you have to learn to go like this. But I can't. It's mine. I'm in control. She goes, really? How much control do you have? Tell me. What if you're fired tomorrow? Are you still in control? No, nope, you lost your job. You weren't in control. What if you're in a car wreck tomorrow? She goes, you got to remember, just open it up. And it's a physical act. 
But the interesting aspect is when you're kneeling at that cross and you're like this, it hurts. It's painful. And you just have to open it up and realize that this is what hurts you. It's what keeps you from your something more. But it took me three days of being there, even after her sitting with me and explaining that all I had to do was let it go, open it up. This simple act of coming from here to here and really going, it's yours. And I didn't, still didn't get it. There's a lot of places here at the monastery where it's just quiet and you can sit. And I found this really great place. It's got a little bench and you're looking up on the hillside and it's got the garden that the sisters plant and pick fruit and vegetables in that they go out and have 10 rows of, I think it's blackberries. And they're out Monday, Wednesday, Friday picking those blackberries, but there's 10 rows you can see them and other plants. And you've got the green trees coming down the hillside. There's just this open field that the deer came to every morning, every night. Two big bucks, nine doe, no. yeah, nine doe and two big, two deer bucks. And they would come down and graze through it, and then they'd walk across the street. There's a flock of quail, little fat ones. <laughs> because the sisters are generous with food to feed the birds. And those quail have learned you just go from bird feeder to bird feeder to bird feeder because God has provided. And they're fat. But they come out on this hillside, and the deer come out, and you can just sit there, and, and you just go, God, what is it? What is it you want to tell me? And time and time again, there's something. The hair in the back of your neck stands up, and you're just like, what is it? And as I sat there Thursday, just after lunch, this, this verse that I wasn't overly familiar with came to me, and I went, no, I don't think so. A couple more minutes went by and it hit again. When Ryan first came here, I asked Ryan, how do you know when God's talking to you? And he goes, you just do. It's a different voice. But the thing I learned about it is when God's talking to you, he might be telling you about something that hurts and he's pulling it out of you, but he's doing it out of love, not out of shame, not out of guilt. Not in that thumb keeping you down. God's not doing it to hurt you. God's doing it to free you. And I sat there listening to the verse. I just kept going, it's not right. So I went back and I pulled out my Bible and I'm sitting in my room, looking out my room, which had amazing views. I think I had, I, there are two doors down. I still think my view was better. Our windows all face the same place. Just so <laughs> And as I sat there reading the verse, the verse was James 5, 16. It says, therefore, confess your sins to each other and pray for each other so that you may be healed. The prayer of a righteous person is powerful and effective. And, and I kept reading that going, no, I, I, I've been confessing to you. And it hit me that I may have confessed it to him, but I hadn't given it to him, and it was still bugging me. But it wasn't the verse that really hit me, it was the commentary, to the point I highlighted the commentary. And in the commentary it says, Christ has made it possible for us to go directly to God for forgiveness. But confessing our sins to each other still has an important place in the life of the church. And it goes on to say, if we have sinned against an individual, we must ask him or her to forgive us. It says, if our sin has affected the church, we must confess it publicly. If we need loving support as we struggle with the sin, we should confess that sin to those who are able to provide support. And the one that really hit me, it says, if after confessing a private sin to God, we still don't feel his forgiveness, we may wish to confess that sin to a fellow believer and, 
and hear him or her assure us of God's part. In Christ's kingdom, every believer is a priest to other believers. And as I sat there, we'd already met numbers of times, and I thought, I need that support. But I know that for me, because of everything I held on to, everything that I clung to thinking, I, I, this is me, I can't get rid of it, and God can't take care of it, and I'm still giving it to him, but it's, it's not working. And I'm thinking, just text him, tell him you need them, and he'll meet him. I know Jeffrey had gone down to the meeting room we'd been in, so I went down there figuring, okay, then I can text Ryan and we'll all come down. And lo and behold, I walk in the room, they're both sitting there. Hmm, that's Matt. <laughs> I had spent a number of mornings before leading up to, and then the mornings at the retreat, being awoken at 3.19 in the morning. Morning after morning after morning. The sermon that I worked on for weeks preparing. I had an outline. I showed my outline to Ryan on, on Thursday morning. It was like, that's not a sermon. That's three sermons. It's like a little mini series. <laughs> if you try to get them to go through 22 Bible references, you're going to drive them crazy. He goes, you should focus here. And he picked five. And I wrote four pages. And as I sat there looking at them, holding those four pages, I said, I can't, I can't preach it. I can't do it. It's not right. And I threw it down. And I said, I don't know what I'm going to do. I said, but these are the struggles. These are my pains. But I still couldn't do it. I was still holding it, clinging to it. And as I sat there, I'm looking at them, scared, afraid. What are they going to think of me? Will they still talk to me? What if they go back and tell their families and come tell you guys? But having told Brian and Jeffrey about this 319, they kept giving me ideas. Larry, go read the third book, 19th chapter, see what it says. Go read every book, chapter 3, verse 19. And lo and behold, that's what I did. And as I sat there that day, I wrote out all these 319 verses. Now, don't get me wrong, I don't have all of them, so don't get, it's not 66 of them. First of all, not every book has three chapters. Aren't you lucky? <laughs> and all the chapter threes don't necessarily have at least 19 verses. Aren't I lucky, because I was writing them down by hand. <laughs> and as I found these things, I wrote them. I mean, things that the hair on my neck stood up, Things that just made me sob sitting there. And as I, as, I, as I go through chapter and verse of God's word, I start realizing, dude, he's got a message for you. Jeremiah 3.19 says, I myself said, how gladly would I treat you like my children and give you a pleasant land, the most beautiful inheritance of any nation. I thought you would call me father and not turn away from following me. And that was me. I called him Father. But he's back here and I just keep standing apart from him. Lamentations 319. I remember my affliction and my wondering, the bitterness and gall. That was me. I was wallowing in everything that was going on. Ezekiel 319. But if you do warn the wicked person and they do not turn from their wickedness or from their evil ways, they will die for their sin. Self-explanatory. <laughs> Habakkuk 319. The sovereign Lord is my strength. He makes my feet like the feet of the deer. He enables me to tread on the heights. It was a message of hope. John 319. This is the verdict. Light has come into the world, but people love darkness instead of light, because their deeds were evil. Foreboding, foreshadowing, the drama of it all. Acts 3.19, repent, then in turn to God, so that your sins may be wiped away, that times refreshing may come from the Lord. Huh. Wow. 
Ephesians 3.19. And to know this love that surpasses knowledge, that you may be filled to the measure of all the fullness of God. First John 3.19. This is how we know that we belong to the truth and how he sets our hearts at rest in his presence. Quiet. Comforting. Revelation 3.19. Those whom I love, I rebuke and discipline. So be earnest and repent. As I read through these, sitting there looking at Ryan and Jeffrey, knowing that God had been talking to me all week. And for the last three years, I sat there sobbing. I was my own worst enemy. I held on to my box. I was just like this. And it hurt. The pain in my hands and my shoulders that tenseness doesn't go away. I sit with it morning at work in church, put on a great face, but I hold it. I'm comforted by my discomfort. But when you're like this, when God comes, he wants to give. And if anybody knows anything about giving, somebody has to receive, but to receive, you got to hold in your hands. It can't be handed to you unless you're open. And I sat there, and I told them. I laid it out. There was nothing but love. Nothing but love. I literally felt Jesus kick my wall down. Dust. No wall. And I just let it wash over me. My brother was telling me, you cut. Just grab it. They agreed. I couldn't preach the other sermon because God handed me this one. They said, you got to share it. We sat for a little while talking and praying. And Ryan said, Larry, you don't understand. You were given the verses. But what's the one thing they always tell you about a verse? Never take it out of context. Never just go with that one. What if it's wrong? So we went to Lamentations 3.19. Lamentations 3.19 says, I remember my affliction and my wandering, the bitterness and the gall. I'm going to keep going. It says, I will, I will remember them and my soul is downcast within me. Yes, this I call to mind, and therefore I have hope. Because of the Lord's great love, we are not consumed, for his compassions never fail. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. I say to myself, the Lord is my portion, therefore I will wait for him. The Lord is good to those whose hope is in him to the one who seeks him. It, was, it is good to wait quietly for the salvation of the Lord. And he goes, even in 319, where it talks about wallowing in everything you hang on to, Christ lets you know there's hope. You just gotta wait on it and get him to come into you. The toughest one for me was Revelation 319. <coughs> Because it says, those whom I love, I rebuke and discipline. And he's tough. Sometimes you think that sin weighs you down, but every now and then it's God's love. Oh, dude, tip it up. I'm still here. And what it says, I, 
Revelation 3, 19. Those whom I love, I rebuke and discipline. So be earnest and repent. Here I am. I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in and eat with that person and they with me. To the one who is victorious, I will give the right to sit with me on my throne. Just as I was victorious and sat down with my father on his throne. Whoever has ears, let them hear what the Spirit says to the churches. And in all of this, I realized that the junk in the box was harm, hurt, pain that I put on me. I held on to it. I couldn't let it go. I thought that this was where I was supposed to live, right here. That if I opened up, God opens up a whole new world and says, you'll be victorious, and you will get to sit on my throne with me, with my Father. If all we do is take what hurts us, take the things we hang on to, and give them to Him, I have three by five cards here. I'm gonna hand them, I'm sorry, I'm gonna have the guys hand them around. So if we wait on me, I'll take all day. <laughs> um, the reason I'm passing them out is, just think about stuff. If there's something that you're hanging on to, I brought pens. What I want you to do is just sit for a few minutes and pray on it, and if God says that there's something in your life that he wants you to get rid of because you're hanging on to it you're comfortable in your discomfort i want you to write it down pray to god about it write it down my box which i was so happily joyfully overjoyed to get rid of has a slot in the top once you write it down give it to god Bring it to him once and for all. Open your hands. Give it to him. He stands waiting for you. Knowing that it's, it, he's there. To help anybody who may be uncomfortable if you decide to write something down and you don't trust somebody's going to read your handwriting, I brought two big markers. Big wide ones. Giving it over to God makes it go away. If you write it down, take the marker when you come up and you want to pray over it, grab that marker, line it out, it's gone. Throw it in the box. The box won't be open, the box will be cut. Take it out, throw it in a dumpster, not necessarily ours, but a dumpster so that it doesn't come up anywhere. Don't put your names on it. But if there's something in your heart that you just want to give up, hand it over. And trust that he's going to be there. I'm going to have a song played right now. Um, while it's playing, pray on it, think about it. If there's something you have, write it down. Come up if you want to.